Now, I want to understand what sigma star does when sigma is a transposition. So now, we want to understand when sigma is a permutation, is a transposition. So let me remind you, our goal in this video was to prove the theorem that I stated some time back. So maybe it's a good time to recall the theorem. The goal of the theorem is, the goal of the video is to prove this theorem. If you have a permutation rho and you have two different representations as a product of transpositions, they are both sigma is are two cycles, or tau is are two cycles, then k and t are both even or odd. And in order to do this, let me recap what we have done so far. We have defined a polynomial and we have defined what is the modification of that polynomial via an element of the symmetry group, sigma star f. And I looked at various examples to explain what is sigma star f. And then I commented that when I take the product of two permutations and apply star, it is same as first applying the first one and to apply the second one to the resulting uh, polynomial, sigma star then apply to tau star f. Okay, And I proved that and hopefully it is clear to you as we have seen in several examples. Now I want to understand what is tau sigma star f when sigma is a permutation. Again uh, we have seen this in our examples. we got sigma star f was minus f. If you recall, sigma star f was minus f whenever we, in our example, sigma was a 2 cycle. For example, in the exam, in this example, when sigma is 1, 3, sigma tau star f is minus f. Okay. So is this always true that if you have a, si a, per a transposition, then it is star is minus f, yes, this is always true. Okay, so I am going to prove this, but let me first an easy case of this first uh, and hopefully uh, that you will be convinced and then I will give you a more general proof. So first of all take a special case, as a special case consider sigma is 1, 2 and uh, n is general here. So, and what is sigma of f, sigma star of f, sigma star of f, remember what it does. So, f remember, first of all recall what is f in general now, x is x1 minus x2, f is x1 minus x2, x1 minus x3, x1 minus xn, then you have x2 minus x3 x2 minus xn and then you have other terms. I am only interested in terms which involve x1 other terms. Right? Is this clear? We have x1 minus x2, x1 minus x3, x1 minus xn, then x2 minus x3, x2 minus xn, then x3 minus x4, x3 minus x5 and so on. But remaining terms do not involve 1 and 2, right? So I do not care about that. So now what is sigma star f? Sigma is 1, 2. I am only interested in 1, 2. Sigma star of 1, 2, uh, f will be the all these first few terms will change now. So it will be x2 minus x1, right? Then x2 minus x3 up to x2 minus x1, xn because the first term 1 and 2 are interchanged, so it becomes x2 minus x1. Second term 1 becomes 2, so x1 becomes x2 and x3 is fixed, so x2 minus x3, x2 minus x4 and then x1 minus xn, so that is x2 minus xn. What happens to the terms involving x2? x2 becomes x1, right? so it is x1 minus x3, x1 minus x4 all the way up to x1 minus xn and other terms. Other terms are fixed because other terms are 
terms whose subscripts are different from 1 and 2 and sigma does not change them so they remain as remain the same right other terms remain the same so now how do what is the change now x1 x minus x2 became x2 minus x1 so there is one minus sign right one interchange of the variable order so x1 minus x2 became x2 minus x1 but if you now look at this no other interchanges have happened we have just reordered them x1 minus x3 comes here x1 minus x4 comes here x1 minus xn comes here x2 minus x3 comes here x2 minus x4 x2 minus xn so all other terms so there is only one change of sign right so this is minus f so remember i am claiming that if sigma is a transposition sigma star f is minus f and i have proved it at least in the special case that you have 1 2 okay so sigma star f is minus f okay now i'm going to spend next 5 minutes proving this in general and you can uh, hopefully you have understood what happened in our examples and in this special case in this general thing is important to prove but if you are not i mean it's more important that you are convinced that it is true based on these examples okay so let me now prove in more general cases in general we have sigma star f equals minus f if sigma is a transposition okay so this is what i want to show sigma star f is minus f so i'm going to assume let sigma it's a transposition right so in other words it's a two cycle so let us say sigma is ij with i less than j i can always assume that because remember ij is same as ji so i and j are different obviously so i can put the smaller one first and the bigger one in the second position it's a cycle so ij is same as ji so i can always arrange them so that the first one is the smaller one and now let us investigate what is sigma star f okay so let us investigate what is sigma star f this involves us this requires us to investigate what is sigma star of a particular term in f okay so consider a term of the form x u minus x v right where u is less than v remember these are because i have used uh, i and j to denote sigma i have now used u and v to denote a term this is a typical term right f remember consists of products x u minus x v where the first index is strictly smaller than the second index in order to determine what is sigma star f i need to see what it does to a term like this really what we need to do is we have to figure out to find what is sigma star f we have to determine how many terms of the form change sign right under sigma right because if if you know how many forms change the how many terms change the sign then we know what happens to f if the number of changes is even you have 
sigma star f will be f if the number of changes is odd sigma star f will be minus f so when does the question is so the question we want to address is the question question is when does this change sign so when does x u minus x v under change always under sigma to x a minus x b with b strictly less than a right when does this change sign when you have a bigger thing minus a smaller thing you start with a smaller thing minus bigger thing so uh, here of course u is less than v you only start with such a term u less than v and see when it changes to b less than a the second term less than the first term so in order to address this let us consider various cases if u and v do not belong to the set ij right if u is different from i and j and v is different from i and j x u minus x v does not change that is clear enough right because if sigma what does so remember sigma x sigma star of x u minus x v is x sigma u minus x sigma v so we are now focused on when is sigma u for what sigma sigma u is strictly bigger than sigma v so we want we are interested in for which sigma u becomes strictly more than sigma v right the first index is strictly bigger than second index the trivial case would be if u and v are different from i and j then sigma u is u sigma v is v right because if and sigma is ij if u and v are both different from i and j sigma of u is u sigma of v is v so they, this does not happen now let's consider the other cases so we have remaining cases are the following case 1 so we can have u equals i and v equal to j so remember u is strictly less than v and i is strictly less than v so you can have u equal to i v equal to j then what is sigma star of x u minus x v this is x sigma u minus x sigma v but u is i so this is x v minus x u so this is one case where sigma u is of course bigger than sigma v so in this case the cha sign changes so in the, this is one situation where sign changes let's take case 2 let's take u to be i and j is something else okay so v is something else so if you take u to be i so then what we have is um let's see in this case see remember i have already dealt with the case that u is different from i and j v is different from i and j so one of them must be u one of them must be j if one of them is i the other is j both happen then that's case 1 other cases u equals i and v is not equal to j let's say okay in this case what do we have we have u equals i which is less than uh we have two cases so so let, let us suppose that let's compare v and j so if v is less than j 
so you have u equals i right so th this is a sub case of case 2 in this case what happens to x u minus x v under sigma star sigma star of x u minus x v this becomes X, this is x of sigma u minus x of sigma v but u is i so this is x of sigma i which is j and sigma v remember v is different from i and j so this is just x v right in this case a change of sign happens because i am assuming v is strictly less than j so sign change occurs right on the other hand i'm still assuming u is equal to i but let's say j is strictly more than strictly less than v v is different from j so j is either strictly more than v or j is less than v in this case what happens so sigma star of x u minus x v is x j x u will go to x of sigma u which is j and v is fixed v is different from j so this is x j minus x v but in this case you have j strictly less than v so here there is no sign change right because you have smaller minus bigger so there is no ch sign change sign change only happens when you have bigger minus smaller here j is strictly more than v but you have x j minus x v what about case 3 u is different from i and v is j right in this case remember u is strictly less than v always so in this case we have again two possibilities either u is less than i and i is less than j which is equal to v in this case what happens to sigma star of x u minus x v x u u is different from i and certainly it's different from j so this is x u and v is j so this is x i right sigma of v is i and i am assuming u is less than i so there is no sign change right now let us consider the last sub case of case 3 i is less than u and j is equal to v in which case sigma star x u minus x v is x u again u is different from i and j so that is x u and v goes to uh, i v is j so v goes to j under sigma and here u is strictly more than j so there is a sign change sign change occurs okay so let us now see how many times let us count how many times sign change happened let us count how many times sign changed sign changed remember in case 1 that is one case u equal to i v equal to j so that is one case this is corresponding to ok so let us uh, once for u equal to i and v equal to j ok now when else it happened in case 2 it happened whenever remember i and j are fixed we are counting how many times u v have the property that sigma u is strictly more than sigma v so it happens when u is i and v is j right so v is strictly between when u is i and v is strictly between i and j how many numbers are between strictly between i and j so if you list all the numbers 1 2 i then you have i plus 1 i plus 2 j minus 1 and j 
so it has to be strictly between so what is the possible range for this is u and j has to be among this v has to be one of these right how many numbers are there so v has for u equal to i v has j minus 1 minus 1 i choices right you have you take j minus first j minus i j minus 1 numbers and remove the i that v cannot be so there are these many choices now on the other hand when v is j also we have sign changes when v is j the sign change is when u is between i and j u is strictly between i and j okay so again the same concept so you have 1 2 up to i i plus 1 and j minus 1 and j j equals v so u is among this okay so there are for for v equal to j there are again j minus 1 minus i choices for you so now the num sign changes so finally the sign changes once when u, u is i v is j j minus i minus 1 when u is i and j minus i minus 1 when u v is j and this is 1 plus 2 times j minus i minus 1 so this many times the sign changes so now we are able to finally say what is sigma star f okay so it is and this remember is an odd number no matter what i and j are twice this number is even so 1 plus that is an odd number so you have odd number of sign changes so this is sigma star we can conclude this right sigma star f is minus f so this is what i have said some time ago i claim that sigma star f I, after doing an example, I said in general sigma star f is minus f. Okay, so in the last 10 minutes or so, when I proved this, uh, it is possibly confusing to you. But this is the complete proof. Please, if you need it to, if you need, please go over the video again, and hopefully it is clear to you that for any transposition, we have sigma star equals minus f. So now we have proved two things. Let us recall. We have proved two facts. One was sigma tau star f is sigma star of tau star f. Here sigma and tau are arbitrary permutations of Sn. The second is sigma star f is minus f if sigma is a transposition. right we have proved these two facts sigma star f is always minus f if sigma is a transposition so now even if the previous 10 minutes uh, that we took to prove 2 if it's not completely clear please uh, start focusing again you can go back and read hear that proof again later if it's not clear to you but it's now uh, easy to conclude the theorem so now we get back to to the proof of the theorem. Remember in the proof we have two possible representations of rho as a product of transpositions. We wrote this as sigma 1 through sigma k product also as tau 1 tau 2 tau t. So we are trying to show that we want to show 
K and tau have same parity which is to say that they are both even or both odd one is, one is even means the other must be even one is odd means the other must be odd so let us now to prove this let us look at so the proof is almost done okay so proof will be now pleasant having proved the two results let us look at tau rho star f because rho has two representations we can compute rho star f in two ways okay rho star f using the first representation is sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma k star f okay that is because rho is that sigma 1 to sigma k now using the first fact that we have proved sigma tau star f is sigma star of tau star f see we have proved it for two permuta two permutations obviously the same carries over for three permutations or four permutations we have to iteratively apply the same principle so this is sigma 1 star of sigma 2 up to sigma k star f okay and then you repeatedly do this it becomes and sigma is are remember transpositions and what does the second property say sigma star f is minus f so so actually let me write it like this this is sigma 1 up to sigma k minus 1 star of sigma k star f right so i i split off at the last stage sigma 1 through sigma k minus 1 i apply f and then sigma k star f but what is sigma k star f because sigma k is a transposition this is minus f then you apply sigma k minus 1 of this so you repeatedly apply this we get what for each application of sigma i we introduce a new negative sign so this is minus 1 power k f right if it was k was 1 you get minus 1 if k is 2 you get so i will just do this once here so that it becomes clear so sigma 1 sigma 2 are transpositions sigma 1 sigma 2 star f will be sigma 1 star of sigma 2, 2 star f but sigma 2 star f is minus f so this will be sigma 1 star of minus f but that is same as minus of minus f because sigma 1 star is changes the sign so this is f so now if you have a sigma 3 so f is so this is minus 1 whole squared f because there are two terms if you apply it once more it will be minus 1 power 3 because it will be minus minus and so on so it is minus 1 power k f on the other hand we can also we also have we also have rho star f is tau 1 up to tau t star f but this again repeatedly applying tau 1 by 1 this gives tau minus 1 power t f but now rho star f is what it is rho star f is either minus 1 f minus f or f right rho, rho is a fixed permutation so rho star f is either f or minus f so we have minus 1 power k f is equal to minus 1 power t f right because both are equal to this this is equal to rho star f this is also equal to rho star f so minus 1 power k f is equal to minus 1 power t f this means minus 1 power k is minus 1 power t right because if they are both f then minus 1 power k is 1 minus 1 power t is 1 if they are both minus f minus 1 power k is minus 1 minus 1 power t is minus 1 we don't care what it is but they are both equal this implies k and t are both even 
see minus 1 power k is 1 exactly when if and only if k is even. So, if k is even minus 1 power k is 1. So, minus 1 power t must also be 1. So, t is even or if k is odd minus 1 power k is minus 1. So, minus 1 power t must be also minus 1. So, k and t are both odd. So, this completes the proof of the theorem. Which is exactly what I wanted to prove. So, the theorem says that if you have a you have possibly different representations of a of the same permutation the number of times you have transpositions there may not be same but whether they are even or odd is the same so now using this we have a very important definition let sigma be a permutation in sn sigma is said to be even okay so this is what we want to define so sigma is said to be even sigma is an even permutation if the number of transpositions required to express sigma as a product is even okay this is uh, perhaps i mean it's unnecessarily long sentence but what i'm saying is that write sigma as some sigma 1 sigma 2 sigma k where sigma i are two cycles or transpositions okay sigma is even if k is even so then so after you write sigma as a product of transpositions we can determine if sigma is even if k is even sigma is odd if k is odd now you might ask because the representation is not unique uh, how why is this definition uh, well defined because sometimes you might require 3 sometimes you require 5 but the theorem now comes in what is the theorem that we prove say even though the number of transpositions required might be different in each representation we might we will have the same odd number or even number so in one representation if it's even then in all other representations it's even so it's a well defined notion so this notion well defined because of our theorem see the notion will not be well defined if some rep product representation has three transpositions another product has six transpositions then would you define it as e odd or even one requires three the other requires six but the point is that does not happen if one representation requires three then any other representation will require odd number it may not be three but it will be odd so we are guaranteed that they are all odd so we can define it to be odd otherwise we are guaranteed that they are all even so it will be even representation so okay so let me uh, stop the video now so this theorem is very important it is an important theorem because we it requires uh, it is required in order to determine whether we can systematically correctly define an even and odd permutation so this notion of even and odd permutations is very important in symmetric groups thank you